in the dominative submissive setting remains nonetheless a part of my psychological formation. It's true, I may fail to access this, either because I do not see what is going on, or perhaps only come to be aware of it at a later date. Alternatively, I may sense that there is something to feel, but block it, and revert to techniques of othering or splitting, which reinforce my sense of the rightness in the dominative arrangement from which I'm acting. I may equally never revert to the mutuality setting or ever see that it applies. And then, of course, I will feel no guilt or injustice. But insofar as I do, then it is my access to the understanding and experience of mutuality in practices of recognition, established in early infancy, <coughs> but plainly of great significance in terms of how adults run their lives, that is important. In other words, the sense of guilt and the need for reparation comes out of the relationship between love and hate. It really is in our gut. It's in our being. It's in our physical being. It's in the pit of our stomach. And it is triggered by situations where we act to dominate and force submission because we know in ourselves that this is wrong. We know it is wrong because we've also been developed in mental processes of mutual recognition. From the point of view of mutual recognition, domination looks wrong and gives us reason to feel the anxiety of guilt. Now with those thoughts in mind, let me return to if this is a woman. Returning to the positions of the perpetrator and the bystander in Sarah Helm's account of Ravensbrück, I think that what I've just said makes sense of the two positions I identified. The position of the bystander or the observer who fails to look the inmate in the eye, but makes a more or less conscious decision to look away, is that of the person who knows that something wrong is happening here to another human being. No matter what they have done, and these women had in fact done nothing wrong, save in the terms of the Nazi regime, in the name of a common humanity, which is the humanity of, the, of mutual recognition, what was being done to them was cruelty beyond cruelty. To look these women in the eye would have been to recognize them as people in their own right, as people who are entitled to recognition and to have their plight recognized. The failure to do so is, from the point of view of mutuality, a failure that can only lead to a sense of guilt a sense that the failure already acknowledges as valid. With regard to the perpetrators, whether they felt guilt or not, whether the feeling came upon them sooner or later, the matter would hinge upon their realization that what they had done, they had done to other human beings who were like themselves, even if techniques of splitting and seeing people as different, projecting difference onto them, othering them, even if these things had licensed a regime of remorseless domination and submission that allowed them to dominate while the other had to submit. Of course, relations of domination are, just, are not just a matter of psychological maldevelopment, and it seems to odd, odd to think of these somehow as part of the bonds of love. An understanding of what happens in these situations is, a, is as much about the ways in which structures of domination exist or are brought into being. From that point of view, individuals may be placed in subject positions that are as much chosen for them as chosen by them. The local young women who liked the glamour of the smart uniforms and the secure jobs did not necessarily foresee what would become of them though some may have ultimately embraced it enthusiastically enough. Nonetheless, the place of guilt would be the place between what they were required to become and what they perhaps embraced on the one hand, and a residual sense of the potential and need for mutual recognition that must have been a part of most of their upbringings, and also, of course, how they related to others who had not been split off and projected as unworthy of respect. The amazing thing for people encountering these, these women and, uh, and others was their ability to have perfectly normal family relationships, to, um, to love their pets, all these kinds of things. So there's plenty of mutual recognition going on, but it was split off 
and by othering the, these, these um, so mutual recognition and domination and submission were both parts of their life. So, the power of love is the process of mutual recognition. The love of power is the process of domination and submission. And a concept of guilt anchored in Klein's somatic account of love and hate uh, bring, gives us a, a, not just a, a thought about guilt, but a feeling of guilt. So there's more to say about that, I'm now concluding. There's more to say about this, but it seems to me that linking Klein's effective account of the basis of guilt, of the guilt feeling in connection with love, and then hate and reparation, provides a basis to think beyond philosophical argument and reflection, and beyond law. It permits us to ground guilt in the human condition from the earliest days, and to understand just how important such an emotion and resulting ethical quality may be. Adding Benjamin develops the sense of how interaction between parent and child and adult and adult operates. This may provide us with an understanding of how the guilt emotion and resulting ethics have a specific form that is just as relevant in the social world as in the relation between parent and child. The juxtaposition of relations of equality and mutual respect with relations of dominance and submission might be said to constitute the socio-political quality at the core of modern societies. Linking this directly to the nature of the sense of guilt, seeing guilt as the moral stroke erotic sentiment that sits between equality and domination, with the relationship between the two acting as its driving force, seems a good way to proceed. In developing this thought, two final points may be made. The first is that while this approach locates the sense of inner guilt, it also permits us to think through related moral concepts such as forgiveness. The injustice in submission that is measured by the possibility of mutual equality and recognition is a wrong and a harm to the person so affected. So if, if I am forced to submit, then that's a wrong to me. I am harmed by it. And I know I've been harmed by it because I'm also aware, I also access notions of equal recognition. The victim would like to have the wrong or harm addressed so that the position of equal recognition is restored. Once so restored, there would be a basis for meeting the guilt of the, wronged part, of the wronging party with a recognition that their guilt has been assuaged by a resulting reparation. The return on both sides to a place of mutual recognition would be based upon a confession of guilt on the one side and a forgiveness in light of the confession and reparation on the other. The second point, and this is where I finish, is that this grounding of the sense of guilt and reparation in the love and forgiveness, perhaps, in the love-hate domination, in the love-hate domination recognition positions, only takes us so far in relation to law. In terms of the legal architectonic of responsibility and guilt, crime and punishment, we would need to consider further the effects of identifying this underlying affective and ethical basis. In exploring further the implications of the tension between recognition and domination under modern social conditions, we would have to think about the role that law plays in both aspects of recognition and aspects of domination. We might think that the legitimacy of law would still need to be thought through in a critical fashion. I doubt that developing our thinking in relation to guilt will leave law's legitimacy unquestioned, though it will at the same time give some sense of what it is that law is doing and what is, in many ways, a kind of common sense about the nature of the criminal law. Thank you very much.
questions? Transitional justice contexts. You know, if you think about South Africa or you think about uh, Rwanda or most countries in Latin America, they all they all have undergone transitional processes where these questions of you know, well, how do you, well, there's two things going on there. I think one is how do you make a system change where the people uh, where where relationships of domination and submission have really existed. Significantly, how do you make a system change there, and and how do you get and then it, how do you make that system change, and then how do you introduce uh, conceptions of mutual recognition where uh, systems of domination and submission existed, and, and um, it's an open question. It's an open question as to how that works, um, and it's an open question that has to be analysed contextually in terms of what's going on in these different contexts. But the, the short answer to your question is that, um, that, 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 the things, that the things that need to happen, happen if they happen because people want them to happen through processes of talking with each other and through, uh, through dialogue. Otherwise, they don't. Can I add one thing to work with, as I said? To me, this, from my experience, I'm saying, um, as a court judge, when I was sitting in criminal jurisdiction, we generally <laughs> visit uh, jail, so the hard jail, occasionally just to, I, I mean, see the jail conditions of inmates, etc. And uh, I don't know whether you have gone to the uh, hard jail or not, but you must have read about it that there's so many NGOs working. Um, uh, I mean, with different welfare schemes for the inmates. Now, there's one NGO called Vipassana. And I still distinctly remember, uh, it is in relation to guilt, of course, uh, somewhat different from what uh, Professor Allen said, but uh, uh, relevant to what uh, your question is. And when we went there, there were certain doctors who are running this NGO saying that you had committed a particular offence. It may be uh, robbery, it may be murder, it may be any other heinous crime. But most of such convicts, they rationalise, they think whatever they had done was correct. So they would not admit guilt. They would either, they know that they have committed, but they will have some justification within their mind because of which what they would say that whatever they have done is right under the circumstances and therefore they are not criminals and they, they are not offenders and they should not have been punished or should not have been convicted. And he said to us that look, then when we talk to them and uh, so it's a position of we may say domination at that stage and not a lack of recognition, they are not recognizing the other side or the existence of the other side and they uh, I mean, overpowered the other side or committed that particular crime. And But he says that uh, those doctors told us 
that after undergoing this vipassana course for three weeks or four weeks, at least 80 to 90 percent, which is a very significant, uh, I mean, uh, uh, number, 90 percent ultimately realize their mistake, their guilt, and that recognition of what they had done to the other side was wrong. They say that they cry, they weep, they ultimately accept what they have done is wrong, and they come out, I mean, uh, as reformed persons. So, I, as I said, that maybe not be directly, but uh, uh, to some extent it may answer. And what uh, Professor Ellen has also said, that it is mutual dialogue, mutual discussion. And they have some course in psychology or whatever, I don't know. We didn't go into the details of that. But he said that this is the success of Vipassana. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, so the idea is that um, parent and child and adult and adult are, are different things. Um, and um, you can have a, a relationship of mutual recognition between a parent and, and child or an adult and an adult. That's, that's where the recognition comes in. It's another question then about the relationship between the recognition of an individual and an individual um, as we talk, for example, and, and if you bring in a political institution such as a state, then you've got, you've got to think quite carefully about the way in which a state operates in relation to its individuals and whether the state, so I, I think there's, a, there's room for a dialogue, uh, not just between um, person and person or wrongdoer and perpetrator and victim, but also, I think that a state, a government, a, polit a, a polity has a role to play in terms of thinking through what it does to allow, to support um, one environment, one social and political environment or another. So I don't, I don't think, it's not a straight question of recognition between the state, because as you say, they're not, they're not equals. They're, they're different animals, actually. So you have to think differently about, about that, and you have to think about, well, what are the social conditions that the state permits to happen, that make the crimes happen? And, and it's, a, it's a more complex question. That's why I said at the end that um, you've got to think about the ways in which any state operates, uh, and the legitimacy of the ways in which it operates, as part of the broader question of how we do recognition. But I want at the same time to say that you know, one thing we can start with is a sense of, well, okay, that, that may be happening there, but also what, what did we do? You know, that I, don't think, I don't think it's enough to just do the, the sort of, well, to explain everything is to forgive everything kind of route. I think you have to think about, well, where does, where does individual agency sit in relation to this more complex setting? Hello? Yeah, when you talk of guilt in a criminal justice system, it's post the event, as in to uh, just, I mean, like, uh, justify what, ha I mean, like, what uh, a person after he has done an act, uh, what he feels. But what is needed in a criminal justice system is, like, to understand what led him to make the, uh, perform that act, the perpetrator performing an act. So, how do you explain that in this uh, Klein and uh, Benjamin system? I mean, will be a uh, case where the person is dominant as well as hate that let, leads him to do a particular act. Mm. So how do you place that? Well, so what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is the sense in which uh, we can access, we are subjected to and we, have, we can access uh, possibility of mutual recognition or domination and submission. And what I said at one or two points in the lecture was that uh, 
whether which whichever of those positions is um, is available to us at any particular point in time is quite uh, structured by the social relationships that, that go on around about. So the women concentration camp guards would probably never have done what they did, except for the fact that they existed in the Nazi state. So um, there's, there's that broader sense of the what, there's that broader sense of the, it's the complexity of living in a modern society which has got which has got significant structures of domination in place. Um, and the ways in which that we access that. So if you think about the relationships between men and women, for example. You know, these don't go away because they have a conversation. Or you have a conversation after a crime. You know, there's, there's a, a repeated structure of domination uh, in play, and, and so it's complicated as to how things turn out, and it's not straightforward to achieve um, a, a passage from domination to mutual recognition at all, and we shouldn't think that it is. And also because, because we, we do live, live in a state system, I mean, the social relations are shaped largely by the past... Bourgeois phenomenon. If we think of recognition as being simply something that happens amongst citizens um, within a, a, a capitalist society, then we we have a problem in terms of how do we get from that to the kind of recognition that I'm talking about. Well, you know, whatever so whatever the whatever the relationships are within the society uh, as a whole, you know, we can talk about the structures of domination that exist. Um, but at the same time, we have to think through what it means to be human within those social contexts. You know, we're not just, the, the, we are severely conditioned by our histories, but our moral being is at the same time within those histories, but also has, has something more to it. And that something more to it is what it means to be human. And what it means to be human is to have, uh, to, to access a grammar of emotions one of which is is the feeling of guilt. So I wouldn't want to necessarily deny anything, any of the premises in your question. I would just want to say that I think that if we want to talk about being human, we have to we have to go deeper than just thinking about.